The vast majority of North American homes are at high risk of water damage and rot. Building science research on high R-value walls has shown just how easily moisture can build up inside of walls when insulation is in the wrong place. And those same physics apply to almost every wall out there. Homes built with only cavity insulation, meaning no insulation on the exterior of the wall assembly, are very prone to getting wet and starting to rot. And that's almost every house out there. You know the type. Two by four is at 16 inches on center, with insulation stuffed between the studs, plastic vapor barrier on the inside if you're up north. That way of building, it will eventually rot. Almost always. So why does this happen? Because those walls don't just leak air or water, they leak heat. When the thermal control layer, the insulation, sits inside of the structure itself, the sheathing on the outside gets cold, and a cold surface is where warm, relatively more humid indoor air loves to condense. That's how seemingly perfectly good walls slowly rot from the inside out. Our modern push for energy efficiency has made buildings tighter than ever, and in many cases, sicker than ever. In this video, we'll look at what building science reveals about how moisture gets into walls, how today's codes are prioritizing energy efficiency over occupant health, and how ancient materials like rammed earth are really the key to restoring both durability and health. So let's talk about the thermal control layer, where it goes and how materials, air tightness and moisture all interact. Because getting that balance right is what can separate walls that quietly decay from those that can last for centuries, including walls like rammed earth, which use thermal mass to rein in the rapid temperature swings that light frame walls allow. Here's the key thing to understand. Temperature governs moisture behavior. As air warms up, its capacity to hold water vapor, its absolute humidity rises dramatically. So when that warm, moisture-laden air cools down, it can no longer hold as much water and the excess condenses into liquid. I dive deeper into how air carries and drops moisture in the air control layer episode. You will find the link in the description below. So what that means is that any part of the wall that becomes cold relative to the indoor air can turn into a condensation surface. We've made energy efficiency the headline of green building, lead, net zero, all of it. But real sustainability has to go deeper. It's gotta also be about durability and health. That means maintaining wall surfaces that are temperature stable enough to keep water vapor as vapor instead of letting it condense into hidden moisture that slowly eats away at the structure. So what did the scientists actually find when they tested a bunch of wall assemblies? The Building America research team built and modeled about 15 wall assemblies in different climate zones across the United States from warm and humid to cold and dry to see which ones stayed dry and which ones quietly collected moisture over time. The walls that performed best weren't the ones that were packed with the most insulation. They were the ones with the insulation in the right place. That's the essence of the perfect wall idea Put all the control layers, water, air, vapor, and thermal outside of the structure itself. That way the structure should stay warm, dry, and protected year round. But even then, air tightness is still non-negotiable. The perfect wall only stays perfect if its air barrier really works. And most codes still don't even require exterior insulation, though they do now make room for it. Most codes now recognize that walls perform best, or most walls perform best, I should say lightweight frame walls perform best, when at least some insulation sits outside of the structure. For this approach to work, there are minimum ratios required. The colder the climate, the more insulation you need outside of the wall's exterior sheathing to keep the wall assembly above dew point. 
Building science research lays out the minimum ratios. They're around 25% exterior insulation in mild zones, climbing to 40 to 50% uh, in the coldest zones. If you meet or exceed that ratio, you actually don't even need a dedicated vapor retarder. However, most codes will still require a vapor retarder regardless, though they will allow for a more vapor open one like painted drywall or plaster, which would be like a class three vapor retarder instead of a true vapor barrier. But again, the balance only holds if the wall is truly airtight. Even one small gap in the air barrier, a missed tape joint, a leaky sill, can move a lot of moisture into a wall and that's all it really takes to wreck the whole system. And really, in practice, most walls are still built with all of the insulation inside of the cavity, a design that only works if the materials and air tightness are pristine, which again is almost never the case. The classic high-risk wall as described in the Building America paper. Building scientists are now discouraging a polyethylene vapor barrier on the inside as it blocks drying to the interior and traps moisture right where you don't want it. When the ratio of insulation between the outside and the interior of the wall is balanced, a vapor barrier really isn't needed. Yet in practice, it's still used almost everywhere, mainly because most code requires vapor control, especially in uh, cold climates, and polyethylene is the cheapest and most familiar option on the shelf. So the lesson here isn't complicated. Keep the structure's temperature stable, no cold surfaces in the wall, keep the air out, and make sure the wall can dry in at least one direction. That's it. It's not about high-tech products, it's about physics and getting the basics right. So now that we understand how temperature drives moisture, let's look at how we can control temperature, not just with insulation, but with mass. North American building science often treats insulation as the absolute hero. Keeping heat in during winter and out during summer, and in terms of comfort, it can work. But when it comes to moisture management, insulation alone usually doesn't keep a building safe. All insulation slows heat flow, that's its job. But only exterior insulation keeps the structure itself warm and stable. When insulation sits inside the wall cavity, it still slows the flow, but the outer layers of the wall get cold and that's where condensation and hidden rot can begin. That's where thermal mass can add another kind of control. Traditional materials like cob, adobe, stone, brick, rammed earth, and even concrete all store and release heat slowly. That's thermal mass. Side note though, concrete behaves differently when it comes to moisture. It eagerly soaks up water through something called capillarity, yet struggles to dry. I explore that more in the water control layer episode. You'll find the link to that in the description below. So the delay, for example, between when the sun heats the outside of a wall and when the heat reaches the inside is called a phase shift. In lightweight framed walls, that phase shift might be an hour or two. In a 20 inch thick rammed earth wall, it can be 10 to 12 hours or more. That means by the time the day's heat finally migrates inward, the air outside has already cooled and the heat flow reverses. It's about smoothing out the temperature swings. Traditional rammed earth thrived in mild climates where the walls could absorb heat by day and release it at night. But in regions that can get very cold, like here in Canada, that same mass can eventually cool right through, which is why Tim Cron, author of Essential Rammed Earth Construction, adds an insulation layer between the two layers of earth. Uh, that's the double wife wall system of sire wall type builds. In Europe's gentler climate, Martin Rauch, author of Refined Earth, often wraps his walls in thin vapor open mineral wool uh, insulation and that will keep the earth's mass inside to moderate temperature and humidity naturally. In both cases, the goal isn't to trap heat or seal the building like a cooler, it's about keeping the entire building envelope in balance with the environment. 
That balance between insulation and inertia, between thermal resistance and thermal storage, is what creates a stable, resilient building. And it's also what protects against moisture. Because when the temperature of the wall doesn't fluctuate wildly, you don't get the repeated cycles of condensation and drying that stress modern materials. In other words, insulation keeps cold out, but mass keeps everything steady. Modern building codes claim to protect us, but they mostly protect energy. Today, even our most advanced buildings, energy efficient, airtight, and code approved, are quietly failing the people who live in them. By sealing off walls that get wet and can't dry in time, we've created ideal conditions for mold to grow where we can't see it. The tighter we build, the less natural air exchange we get, and the more every trapped contaminant, from VOCs to mold toxins, linger in the air we breathe. Building scientists have been sounding the alarm for years. They've mapped the moisture dynamics, measured dew points, and shown how current practices are undermining durability and indoor air quality. But the codes refuse to catch up. Energy efficiency still outranks human health. In places like Switzerland, building codes already acknowledge what the data and traditional wisdom have always shown. A wall must manage moisture as intelligently as it manages heat. But in North America, efficiency has become the sole measure of success, even when it comes at the cost of well being and health. And perhaps the most elegant expression of that idea, that buildings should manage moisture as intelligently as they manage heat, isn't new technology at all, but ancient wisdom. Walls of earth shaped by hand, inherently balance humidity, regulate temperature, and breathe without leaking. Rammed earth is a reminder that progress doesn't always mean invention. Sometimes it means remembering what worked. If you're enjoying this series and learning something new, I would love to hear your thoughts. Leave a comment below. It helps to shape what we explore next. And if you haven't already, hit subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. See you next time.